Those of you who got an invite, welcome to Nerd Prom. <laughs> no matter where in the world you are, we're all Nerds International. With the hyphen. The Murder Homo Show presents the Savage Rifter Podcast. <laughs> oh, where are we? Oh my god, there's a robot! What? It's Run away! Podcast. Welcome to the Savage Rifter Show, episode 20, the big 2-0. I feel like we're no longer teens. Can we vote yet? No, they're not going to let us. Yeah. Our record doesn't allow us to. I am one of your hosts, Gary, a.k.a. the Murder Hobo, and I am here with none other than the world-renowned and infamous Rift superstar, DJ Jazzy Diaz. Y'all ready for this? Of the Savage Rifts G Plus community fame. Twice in a row, Victor. This is amaze balls, is it not? I mean, how fascinating <laughs> is this? This is what happens when you go on hiatus and you come back. Ladies and gentlemen, as usual, you guys know what we're doing. Game on, Gary. This is your host, Victor the Savage Drifter Diaz. We're going to be talking about a little bit of vehicles today in the one and only Savage Rifts. Nice. I'm actually excited because I was p- taking a sneak peek. Uh, and uh, there's some kind of like skyboat thing that sounds pretty interesting. So... <laughs> <laughs> This is a podcast all about Savage Rifts. We break down Savage Rifts piece by piece so Victor can teach me and you, the listener, how to play, enjoy, and understand Rifts. Today's going to be vehicles, like we said, and uh, we're going to get right into it because uh, that's just how we roll. This might be a short issue or a a short episode uh, because vehicles doesn't really take up that much space, uh, but we're going to talk about a few other things. And I happen to know that they're going to be changing some things in the... uh, Savage World Adventure. Apparently, they're taking out um, acceleration and stuff like that. Vehicles are going to be changing big time. That's more than I know, Gary. Spill it. What do you know? Oh, I read a thing here or there. I don't know. Maybe it was just Eric telling me because he's such a he's such a uh, a Savage World savvy kind of fellow. <laughs> but uh, all right. Well, that said, let's go check out and see what uh, what's new in the community. <laughs> suit-wearing guy. Yes, that's me. Don't I know you from someplace before? Yeah. Yeah, I do know you. What's new with you, man? Well, I, I suppose I can tell you what's new. From the Rifts. Journey Jakes and the Postler's Nick Race. Did you, <laughs> did you look at this? It has something to do with DBs. Yeah, so this comes out of... um. DBs of North America. So it looks like the the Postlusnik are a race of humanoids from another dimension, like everyone else on Rifts. Is anybody from Rifts, from the actual Rifts Earth anymore? It feels like everybody in Rifts is always from some other planet. I am. Um, <laughs> yeah, so these guys are like seven feet tall, deep, slow voices. Um, they're better known for their natural psionics and the fact that they are organ scavengers. That's right. What? They transplant... They can. They have the need to transplant organs on their person and preserve them closely in a guarded mix of embalming fluid that's capable of keeping living tissue viable indefinitely. Right out of the little PDF that um, this wonderful person has created for us. I gotta say, Anna, you know, it, it's times like when you read these that you realize having small junk would come in handy in this situation. Nobody's gonna. <laughs> Nobody's gonna want mine. <laughs> you'll never, you'll never end up seeing it in a in a in an embalming fluid jar. <laughs> There's not a jar small enough. There you go. Right? Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, I these guys look at this as something somebody you don't want to meet in a dark alley. That's for sure. Yeah, I, I appreciate you backing me up on the size of my junk. By the way, She's a nice guy. I, ju- let's just get it right out there. I have not seen his junk. Let's not start that joke again. Oh my god, <laughs> that's actually a good point. Well, I'm just going to shut up now. We're going to carry on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so these guys actually mean their their title, their um, the actual word, 
Poslusnik is a title that means one who serves. So these guys have a strict code of helpfulness, duty, quiet professionalism. Um, it says if there is a true name of this race of people, it is never spoken. So it looks like nobody really knows what or who they come from. But from what I'm reading about it, it looks like they're really good at using their psionics for um, surgery, for healing, for uh, what's called bioregeneration. Um, they are really good at surgical techniques, which they use to practice on themselves, but they've also made great natural healers. So this could be an interesting companion. Definitely don't want to die around them, though. Yeah, they'll take your bits. So so this is just something that he's created then. Journey Jakes has come up with this. Jason Jason Marker? As, as far as I know of, you know, don't quote me on that. I mean, there's 101 DBs and 101 RCCs and LCCs, probably more than 200 um, for this, the uh, Palladium's Rifts game. So he might have pulled this out of his own hat or he might have uh, grabbed something out of DBs in North America. Right off the top of my head, I don't know. We'll do some research and we'll get back to you guys on that. You know, a lot of times you t people take um, creative license from uh, movies or TV shows that they've seen. So I'm wondering if this maybe came from from that somehow. Uh, that said and done, this guy would be very creepy to have in your party. You know, you blast <laughs> somebody up and all of a sudden he's like, oh, this guy's got a great hand. I'll take it. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I'm Weird. pulling up the DVs of, Amer of North America role book and just going to take a quick perusal with the, the find button to see if we can find anything out about that race. But I want to say... It is a homebrew, but I could be wrong. Nice. All right. Well, while you're doing that, I'm going to talk about Monty Madagascar's converted big bore guns. A little shout out to Victor going on in there. Did you have something to do with uh, putting this all together? Or actually, no, come to think of it, I think he just said that thanks to you and something that you did, he decided to do this. That doesn't really help anybody much, does it? <laughs> yeah, so what what he, I did originally, and it wasn't actually me. Some of the other guys on the other on the uh, Google Plus board went and put together something called the Naruni Weapons Catalog. Um, he used that as a reference to create the Big Bore series catalog for all the different weapons that uh, utilize the Big Bore ammo. So what's really nice about the Big Bore ammo is um, every single pistol, shotgun, rifle uses these Big Bore high caliber. Um, bullets pretty much it's a it's a slug thrower um, but these bullets are so big that they're made to knock down opponents so if you really want some stopping power some drop them on the floor kind of hits you know you pull out a short pistol and he has a holdout derringer which is actually huge in and of itself but there's lots of other weapons that are located in here including one of my favorites or at least one of my combat cyborg favorites is the big boar room sweeper which is a belt fed shotgun multi-barreled vulcan cannon shooting big boar shotgun rounds um, yeah, that thing will put you on your butt quick. But um, these things are great for knocking opponents down. All they have to do is fail a strength check, and they get knocked prone. So it's always good to get your opponent um, off his feet whenever you're using these. There's some pretty cool stuff. He took some art from some of the games, um, put them on there. So I really like it. It's a little short. It's only four pages, but it definitely covers the gambit. Everything from a, a submachine gun shotgun, a belt-fed shotgun. Um, looks like a light and a breech load along with a breech-loading pistol, and then a Magnum revolver with Big Boss, Big Boar rounds. It's called the Big Boss. And, of course, my favorite, a holdout Derringer. Why carry a big rifle what a small pistol can do? <laughs> the friggin' room sweeper is top-notch, man. A belt-fed <laughs> <Yeah>, <laughs> shotgun. Rate of fire, four. So you're rolling four times uh, one to 3d6. I guess it depends on your range. If you're up close, you're doing 3d6 in short range with a shotgun. Sure, and then sure. Right, so four yeah, shots. Exactly. That, yeah, exactly. That's a, so you can do. That's a handful of dice. Yeah, you're going to be hoping for a, a lot of uh, exploding dice from that, and you're probably going to get it in rifts. But even then, at that short range, you're just going to do some devastating damage. Even the Lawman, which is an automatic shotgun, that's more of the traditional, you know, round barrel kind of uh, Thompson machine gun. But this one shoots out um, big bore shotgun rounds. That does one to three d six has a rate of fire of three, but has eighteen shots in that big old round canister. Uh, yeah, and a minimum strength of d ten. You better believe it. That's going to be one sick gun. A little bit of music shot in there. Did you hear that, bad boy? <laughs> I didn't mean for it to play, but it played anyway. Let's Don't hit end. that button. Here we go. Because well, at least at this time it wasn't porn. <laughs> this. Is the trailer that you posted for? I believe it's called Cyber Slave, which has this um, rather Russian-looking deal to it. But uh, I'll turn that off so nobody has to listen to that junk. 
Um, the cool part about it is, man, you want to talk about great inspiration. Did you see the priest guy that's in this thing? Like, I am a huge fan of the priest class. And this guy had this badass-looking giant cross with a circle through it. And then he uh-huh. holds onto it, and it, like, lights up. And then he smashes it into the ground, and it shoots the symbol. And then, like, splits the guy into, like, all of those quadrant pieces. <laughs> I was like, that's freaking awesome. Yeah, oh, that man. was pretty awesome. I liked when the big mutant was carrying that shield, and he was trying to protect himself from the the ray beam that the priest was shooting down at him. It just burned through the shield and right through the guy's head. That was pretty cool near the end there. Yeah, yeah if you guys haven't checked neat. that out, that Cyberslav is done by Evil Pirate Studios. It's produced by um, Stamislav Dimitrov. And um, Evil Pirate Studios has a YouTube channel out there, but check that out. Cyber, Cyberslav trailer is what it's called. It's three minutes of good, juicy anime coming right out of Russia. Is, is Oh, I see. So there's going to be a Cyberslave movie kind of a thing going on here. Yeah, this looks like it's a trailer for it. I can see, yeah, there's a cyberslavemovie.com. Let's go check that out while we're standing here doing nothing. Uh, oh, this is all in it's all in the Rushkins. Oh, translate. I love Google. Google's my friend. <laughs> Turn down. I can't read any of this stuff because it's still partially in Russian. But yeah, it looks great, man. Like These guys are pretty badass looking. Yeah, when I first saw the video, I thought it was going to be exactly what um, we could imagine some of the Rift's combats would be. I was just blown away by the animation. It looked pretty neat. Um, there's some pretty cool scenes in there where it, one guy uses that um, mouth guard mounted flamer and just lights a guy on fire. And the, another similar mutant has like these long knived clawed hands and just shoves them through somebody. It was pretty neat. There was some pretty gory little scenes in there, but there was... It was pretty interesting um, anime, pretty interesting tech. I could easily see it being played in riffs or um, some other type of um, sci-fi genre game. That's how I'm going to take out Dustin Smith if he doesn't get his uh, Anything Can Happen Thursday notebook thing pumped out here. Uh, but well, I guess I should ask him if he's going to do it first before I start telling him that he needs to get her done. Um, speaking of people in the community, Patrick Shadow Dad's Role Players Imaginarium. I was uh, scouring the internet while I was taking the show notes tonight, and I ran into this. And um, he had posted something a while ago about the cryptids of North America. And when I went back to his blog tonight and started reading some of the other posts, there is so much good stuff there. You want a, <laughs> like a strange, weird, or exotic creature for your game, man. This is the place to go. There's a lot of sweet stuff going on there. Yeah, He's, you know, he covers all the traditional ones. I'm looking at it right now, and he's talking about the Jersey Devil. He has an article on Bigfoot. He has an article on jackalopes, um, man dogs, and wolfmen. Even the chupacabras in there. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> I'm going to have to check that out myself. Yeah, That's going to give me a chuckle. That's pretty cool. If you want to get into some weird stuff, you can easily throw this stuff into Savage Rifts, too. He's got a Wendigo. He's got a Mothman. That's pretty sick. Yeah, pretty neat, eh? <laughs> yeah. I've, I've actually like heard a podcast about the Jersey Devil and the uh, Chupacabra. I haven't heard about the Mothman before. That looks interesting. Um, I'd imagine that the Mothman would swoop in uh, while you're not looking and eat your clothes, maybe. Or at least just leave you with holes in your clothes, something along those lines. And what's the Wendigo? I've heard of this too, but for some reason it's not ringing a bell. It's like Bigfoot, but he's uh, he's all covered in white fur, red eyes. Hmm. That looks actually There's, pretty sweet. Like, like an, Yeah, like an albino Bigfoot, I guess it would be. So he's got some Savage World stats here on the bottom of every single article. This one he gives bite and claws as his regular attack. We're talking about the Wendigo here. A regular attack is strength plus D6. Combat reflexes with a plus two to recover from being shaken. He gives them a terrifying visage. A Wendigo's horrific visage is such an annoying, oh, is, is such that anyone seeing it for the first time must make a fear check at minus two. Additionally, once per combat, the Wendigo can try to intimidate a target as a free action. Oh, that's pretty cool. That could get kind of freaky. That would go pretty well in some of the horror based games. Yeah, not too shabby, eh? It's got them all statted out. Yeah, that's good stuff, man. There's some good stuff in there. This is actually going to come in handy, you know, regardless of whether or not you're playing riffs or doing uh, any kind of a thing. You want to toss something like that in, that would be great for like a, a Deadlands campaign or a fantasy campaign. Oh, yeah, for sure. In Deadlands, I think I surely think in Deadlands there is a Wendigo monster in the rule book, but that's still Ooh. pretty cool. That's an interesting twist on that. Yeah, if you guys haven't checked that out, Patrick Shadow Dad's website's called roleplayersimaginarium.blog. 
Nice mm -hmm. job, Patrick. I'm going to have to take a look at that a little more, maybe drop some of those characters into my game. Yeah, I'm going to throw some at Victor, roll some dice, and see if we can't uh, slay some of our friends. Bring it. I got a big bore shotgun to polish off. <laughs> that would actually be pretty funny if you got your big bore out and tried to shoot this bloody thing. Oh, man, that's sweet. All right, well, that said, let's get over to vehicles. That's it for the news. Uh, we did this last week. We did it again, so not much has popped up in the last week. And, uh, yeah, short and sweet, just the way I like it. Okie dokie. Nexus points. Vehicles and vehicle battles. Here we go, Victor. I don't really have too many questions, although I do have questions. So, starting off with a question. Vehicles and vehicle battles on the battle map or theater of the mind, how do you like to roll? It, you know, for me, it all depends on whether or not I have paper models or real minis of vehicles to be able to use on the battle map. So if I'm playing in front of a, you know, my friends, we're playing live at the table and I have the TV out or I have a battle map, you know, pre put together or even some some real battle models out. Because I, of course, you know, I'm a big war gamer, so I have lots of burned out buildings and ruins and sci fi stuff and fantasy things to throw on the table. Sometimes I'll put out a, a nice little battle map like that. So if I have the vehicle models or even a paper model that resembles it, um, I'll use it for rifts. It's been difficult because there are very few models to begin with. So a lot of the models that I do have are, are um, paper models, stand-ins, or I'm using other stuff from Warhammer 40K or other model companies out there that are, or mini companies that are out there making models for them. Um, but usually I try to get that on a battle map because once you get involved with vehicles and with um, characters and then you have a group of enemies, you know, the typical coalition squad, um, they never show up or very rarely show up without some kind of vehicle support, whether it's robots, whether it's a, an APC, an armored personnel carrier, even a couple of hover cycles or, you know, or a flying um, power Titan robot or something. Um, all that stuff is important to kind of keep where it's at on the battlefield for ranges and for distance and line of sight. It, it gets, it's easy to do, but it's, for me, I find it more challenging in the uh, theater of the mind because a lot of the players that I play with want to see what's in front of them. They start asking a lot of questions about, um, am I in line of sight? Am I within range? What's around me? Instead of telling me that they are in line of sight, that they're hiding, that they're coming up with um, you know, um, details to the scene or to the battle map as they play in the theater of the mind. So a lot of my players aren't used to that. Um, but it's difficult because there's so many things going on in Rifts. Again, it's, that's one of the bad things about having a, a game or a role-playing game where it's everything in the kitchen sink. You literally have to think about everything in the kitchen sink sometimes. So I prefer to have a battle map for them as often as I possibly can, particularly with vehicles. Yeah, see, I'm kind of, I go the opposite route. If we're doing regular combat, I'm really? battle mapping it all day long. But when it comes to things like space, spatial variances on such a grand scale, you know what I mean? Like this ship is coming in at 80 spaces i'm kind of thinking is, is sort yeah. of like you know that's its speed right is 80 80 inches or whatever <laughs> I correct don't, i don't have a table that big or a mat that big or any of that kind of stuff i even kind of yeah. find that i have these issues not that i have issues with stuff like this but like even when my players are trying to wrap their brains around being attacked by say like a oh. uh, swarm of razor bats inside of 50 fathoms right you know like you 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 drop your mini on the map, and I basically um, I'm like, okay, it's going to be going on a path this way, and it's going to hit you know this person, this person, and this person, but but they don't really grasp the idea that that it's actually you know it's still moving and it's at a distance away. So I, I find that anytime you're in a situation where you actually have like big variances of distance, like this you know these ships are going to cruise by and they're going to be a quarter of a mile away and you know, a couple of seconds kind of a thing. I just, so I prefer to do theater of the mind that way. Um, it's the only time you're ever going to catch me doing theater of the mind because I I am fully in your camp, man. How far away is it? You know, I've talked about this numerous times, but uh, 
Yeah, but that's the tough part, right? I mean, it's hard to be able to tell. For me, the reason I want to get battle maps um, whenever I have multiple targets, you know, multiple vehicles and multiple groups of, uh, you know, six party members and 15 Skelebots or Zydekicks or whatever they are, um, regardless of the monster, once you start dealing in those big numbers, particularly if it's um, a set piece encounter, um, in other words, me as the GM, I've built up the last two or three encounters to this big fight. I'm going to try to do everything I can as a GM to try to put that on the table to make sure I have all the tokens, I have all the paper models, I have as much of the battle map that I can um, in the time that I'm given in order to be able to play that out, in order to be able to give them all the options that they know of. Plus, it looks really cool on the field. So a lot of the little stuff, a lot of the little battles, I'm not worried about range. I'm not worried about as a GM. I'm not worried about a lot of the minutia because I'm making that up as we go, which is part of the game. I'm more concerned about I need to make sure they survive this encounter, so I'm going to try not to kill them off, but I need to make sure I wear out their resources, I wear out their ammo, I do some damage to them, I try to wound them a little bit or slow them down, um, depending on what the, the plot takes. So, I mean, to each his own, right? Either way, as long as you're having fun playing the game, that's what it's all mm -hmm. about. Exactly. Um, would you, in an instance like this or in an example like this, would you scale it down so that instead of having something shoot across the map at like 80 inches per turn kind of a thing, would you maybe like drop it down so that you could say um, one square is equal to 100 kind of a thing? Yeah, you can scale up the squares. Um, I've done many times where I'll get out small tokens that are just like, um, you know, um, pieces from the game Sorry or small little wooden blocks, even dice or little chips. And I've, you know, I'll put out a large piece of graph paper, you know, two foot by two foot or something that I use for my battle maps. And, I, and I'll change the range, I'll change the scale. Instead of one square being six feet or five feet, you know, which is traditional D&D &D or even Savage Worlds, um, I'll change that scale to one square equals, uh, you know, a quarter mile. Or I'll use range bands where, you know, there's a range band in the middle and, you know, every band is is one range band. So close, near, far, you know, half mile, quarter mile, one mile. It, this is particularly important when you're using weapons or the players are using weapons like rail guns, you know, vehicle mounted cannons, missiles, even mini missiles. They have a range of, I think, a minimum of a mile, uh, maybe even a five mile range. Some of the larger missiles, like cruise missiles, you know, 180 mile range, um, that, you know, that's ridiculous. I'm not going to map out to scale 80 miles, but I'll definitely <laughs> put, you know, I'll put a model of a missile or a little red block or, a, you know, a black chip or something on the on the horizon, so to range band. And then I'll put the players lined up um, on the other side of the paper. And then every turn I'm moving it closer. Um, and it's just like what we talk about in ICRPG where you use the, um, the timer die to turn, you know, to let them know that, Hey, this is getting closer. I've done that too. I've done it in different genres. And I've even used that in riffs where I'll put out a die and say, okay, in five turns, the missile is going to get to you and you four turns and we go around the table and three turns and we go around the table, two turns. So, even with theater of the mind, they can see that clock ticking down. They can see that dice clicking down going, hey, it's on one. We've got to do something now because we can't stop this missile from coming in. We've tried a number of things. We've all missed. Uh, it's dodging it. It's possessed. I don't know. Whatever you want to, whatever reasons that are happening that are not able to take it out in time. Um, they can see the missile coming over the horizon or blipping on their radar. And I've used that um, to tell the story. But again, it all depends on what's more important what's the most important thing for that moment is it to slow the characters down is it to suck up ammo is it to do damage to them or maybe it's just to put it you know the fear of the uh, of what their enemy might have against them if they're going up against um maybe some forces that are mercenaries that have a fortification a fort or a large building or even a big moving uh you know giant like uh adat or something like that um in star wars if you had a large mercenary force that had missiles mounted on it, a couple of rail guns or whatever, they could be shooting from off, you know, off the side of the Mogollon Rim down over into the desert, a hundred miles away, and you won't see the shot coming, but your radar will tell you it's coming. And for me, again, it all depends on that story, whether or not I need to actually map that out, or I need to make it a real battle encounter, or if it's just a couple of pot shots to keep them on their toes, letting them know they can't just walk around with a silver glitter boy through the middle of the desert and not get noticed or not get shot at. <laughs> uh, I imagine that, you know, you're in your neighbor's backyard. You're like, don't worry, I just need to borrow your backyard. We're, we're playing a role-playing game. <laughs> I ran out yeah, of table really. space. <laughs> 
You know, um, when we were younger, there was a there was a toy company that came out. Well, everybody knows what BattleTech is, and everybody knows what a Mech Warrior is. So um, there was this toy company. I think it was Mattel, if I'm not mistaken, and they created these 12 inch tall scale models toys of actual BattleTech um, Mecha. So me and my friends were all like, oh, my God, that's cool. And by younger, I mean, like, we were 20-something. And we were playing in the backyard, in the living room, in the family room, through the front door of the house, to the front yard. Because some of the range was, like, 80 feet of some of these some of these mecha. And we were literally using them to, you know, get line of sight over the couch around cardboard buildings and stuff that was at such a huge scale. Um, I can't imagine playing 28-millimeter scale for riffs, even though it's probably that far. Um, you know, from the front yard to the backyard, just for scale. Um, but that was a lot of fun. But again, that's a you know, that's a different kind of game. That's a different kind of a, a of a battle scenario, battle simulation for that. I wouldn't use that for rifts necessarily. Um, it would be more theater of the mind and more they're this far away and they're getting closer as they come. Unless I can actually put that out there, but it's pretty rare for me to be able to make something that big or have the time to dedicate to such a a complex uh, battle map, so to speak. Yeah, I tend to try and shy away from from doing things like that. You know, most of what I do is 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 not vehicular combat because of all of the intricacies of running it. You know what I mean? Like I like to keep it simple. I do like the fast, sure. fun, and furious. So the more that I can take out of like the complicated parts of the game, the happier I am. You mentioned, <laughs> you yeah. Mentioned... You know what though? For me, the most satisfying battles that I've ever seen in rifts are those um, mixed forces battles where you have a couple of guys in infantry and some mega armor. You have a couple of guys with flying power armor and ground power armor, a couple of combat cyborgs and a juicer running around naked, you know, a guy in a hover cycle, uh, a skull squad, um, excuse me, a skull troop carrier and a spider robot tank. And all of those guys going at it. It's just the math and the number of dice being thrown at the game absolutely memorable when you see that glitter boy um he his dice all explode right in the middle of a vital shot just before he gets taken out by this guy with a vibro knife i mean it's just awesome but that only happens in riffs for me those have been some of the most memorable games um but it, i agree with you wholeheartedly it is extremely difficult it is a lot of attention and a lot of energy that the gm has to be able to keep track of all the math to be able to do that i can't imagine um what it's like but there is a solution to it Savage Worlds has come up with a solution to it. There is a mass combat rules that I think is being included in Savage Black, if I'm not mistaken. Um, and there's also ways to speed up theater of the mind games that um, you do whenever you have a lot of those vehicles and a lot of all the other um, mixed uh, mixed forces there. Um, we've done it in, uh, once or twice in our game, and I'm trying to remember what it is called. Dramatic Interlude, I think, is what it is called. And um, we've, we've done some interludes and we've done some combat interludes kind of along the same, um, the same route using some of the mass combat rules or whatever. So it's, there, there are ways to get around that, to be able to make those speed up, it's particularly if it's just, you know, the party made a, made a bad decision and uh, now they're being attacked by an entire division of coalition forces or whatever. And, well, they're, they're going to learn to die, but it's always fun to watch them do it. You just don't want to sit there and spend eight hours throwing dice at them. Um, trying to kill them off. <laughs> I feel like, you know, in a situation like that, it would be actually kind of ultimately cool to have like a four by eight sheet of landscaped uh, scenario dropped down on a giant table. And then, you know, that's off to the side and you're doing your role playing and whatnot. And then it mm -hmm. just leads into this combat and everything is <laughs> pre-configured so that you're set up and ready to go. And then the idea being that your players know that, okay, like we're going to spend the next hour tactical combat and you know this is how it's going down but i would uh, like i just i feel like i would need to be like well well prepared for that like have it set up and ready to go in order to make it cool yeah um, that's the tough part man that's the tough part is being a gm in savage drifts you can never predict that like you know you have your three or four or five different encounters that you want to do for the night or or for the next couple of games and all of a sudden the party takes a left-hand turn in albuquerque and you're at the bottom of the Grand Canyon and you're searching for maps real quick and you're trying to put together, you know, different Lin Sariel models and you don't have none of that prepared. So some of that has to go into theater of the mind um, or you have to make substitutions or you have to just kind of work with what you got, work with whatever tools or miniatures or models that you have. That's for me, 
the most difficult and the most challenging part of playing a role playing game is having the flexibility, the knowledge and the rule set and just the imagination to be able to come up with a lot of those combat tactics on the fly and being able to manage large, complex fights. Um, a lot of people don't realize that when you get into a Rifts game, whether it's Palladium or Savage Worlds or ICRPG or whatever, whatever system you want to play it in, it's always going to be that difficult because of the mixed martial arts, mixed weapons, mixed different types of, you know, combatants that you can have from, you know, raging cyborg dinosaurs to, you know, Nexus crawling demons, Zyda kicks insect people to, you know, Conan the Barbarian. Throw all that together in a blender and you got yourself one crazy shake. Mm -hmm. I like that. Um, well, you, you did mention ICRPG and, and, and previously you, you did mention um, rings for distances, which is one of the neat things about ICRPG. Um, you've got near or you've got close, which is like melee combat. You could, you know, you can make it to that person and attack. You've got near, which is you could make it there but not attack. They're just sort of out of your range, which right. is pretty sweet. I'm thinking that inside of Rifts, I, I know that Rifts, a lot of people would like the chunky, um, you know, really crunchy, sort of gritty, keep track of everything. But I'm more of a storytelling, let's get it flown and have some fun. And I think I would go that route. You know, he's far away. And, and here's the other thing, too. I would also have this, like, pre-worked out with my players so that they know that when I said he's far away, he's out of range. You know, this guy, you've got this big, you know, right. robot power mech guy. He's he's close. He's coming on you with his sword out, his vibro sword or whatever. You've got a bunch of guys that are near that you could shoot. And then, you sure. know, the other guys are far away. And just keep it abstract like that and just try and get through it, like, as, as fast and power styled as possible. So yeah. that said, and knowing ICRPG, would you pull anything out of ICRPG like that as well? that would maybe enhance your Rifts games? Like, what about the chunk system for handling, say, like, yeah, there's, massive battles? There's a, there's a lot of things that... Well, I've said it on the show before. I've said it on our other podcast before for ICRPG, Index Card Role-Playing Game, for those of you guys who don't know what we're talking about. Um, I've said it before. The chunk system is absolutely genius. The I've And it's crazy because when I first heard about the chunk system and I talked to Hankerin about it... Um, uh, Hank and Farinell's the guy who wrote ICRPG for those of you Savage World fans who haven't discovered that great talent yet. Um, he uses bubbles, little circles to be able to mark out like, you know, how many hit points each arm or each body, just like in the old mech warrior um, printouts that you would use for all your battle tech mechs. Um, so he created his own system called the chunk system. I would use the chunk system to help better clarify the complex rules and running vehicles and robots and armor. Um, I've said it before. I'd say it again. I think ICRPG is a lot better than we give it credit for, and I am still working on it. It, it is there's it's a big, um, big bite to take, but I really want to convert Rifts into ICRPG because of the chunk system. Um, that's really what sold me on it. I, we, you know, we may have to go over this, Gary. We may have to make a a dual show here, and we're gonna run <laughs> a combat scenario using Savage Worlds. And kind yeah. of go through all the math and do that on YouTube. And then the next half hour, 45 minutes of that same uh, video, we're going to have to run the same game, the same scenario in ICRPG so we can show the fans the differences between the two and how well ICRPG can be able to manage something as complex as Rifts. Yeah, I think in a situation like that, if you were fighting like single single battle robots, that would make it, it would, you know, it would be super easy to do. But I don't know if I would apply chunks. Here's the thing. I don't know that I would apply the chunk system across everything in a mass battle. I think once we step into the mass battle category, for me, I'm mass combat ruling it is really what it's going to go oh, there yeah. too. No, I, I totally agree with you there. Um, yeah, again, it depends on, for me, it depends on how valuable that combat is to the story. Like if this is the big bad end guy, he's got three tanks, 15 guys, six demons and the ley line walker for his friend that you're going to fight and you've been building up to that. Well, yeah, I'm going to I'm going to cross every I and dot every T I need in order to make that to work. Um, but, yeah, I totally agree with you. If it's just a one off fight because somebody went crazy and decided to go attack that mercenary company they weren't supposed to go after. Uh, yeah, totally mass battling it, totally using some of the rules 
whether it's ICRPG or Savage Worlds, I'm going to narrow that down to as, as short and as clean as possible. Nice. Okay, well, let's put a nub in that deal there and split over to uh, vehicles. So traveling around the major settlements and cities might come close to resembling the ease of driving around the 21st century. I don't think so. Would it, would it be? <laughs> it would be difficult, wouldn't it? it yeah. It would be really difficult. Anytime that you're traveling in a vehicle in rifts, people got to remember a lot of the roads are destroyed. There is no cross-country wilderness trekking in three hours. You're going to cover 200 miles because it's not going to happen. Uh, there's no highways. There's no major thoroughfares. There might be a few concrete or se semi-repaired roads. Um, some of the major cities will have you know, paved roads and you'll have an easier way to be able to get around some of the major cities or some of the, uh, you know, the big megaplexes like, you know, Chi Town or whatever. But for the most part, you're going to be crossing over, you know, desert, forest landscape, lakes, swamps, and there's not really much road there. And what little bit of road there is, you're going to go for a hundred yards and then you're back out in the difficult terrain again. So there, there is like gasoline powered vehicles, right? Everything isn't just powered by magic anymore. Sure. No, there's fossil fuels. There's nuclear cells. There's power cells. There's um, energy, um, energy or batteries and a bunch of different types, including Techno Wizard. Some of the vehicles are marked as Techno Wizard craft, and you can build a Techno Wizard, you know, hovercraft or whatever, and you can run it off a of PPE. <laughs> I want to have like a um, a motorcycle, and it's just got like missiles on the front and back, and, you know, like or or a BMX, like ET. Except where E.T. would sit would just be missiles. <laughs> <laughs> that would be sick. Yeah, I right, love it. Right until you got run over by your first guy in a, in a vehicle that came along and you're riding the dumbass bicycle. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the first the first character I ever saw or ever wanted to play was the Techno Wizard because I saw a picture of a Techno Wizard on a wing board, which looks like, um, you know, like uh, I would say call it a skateboard without wheels turned sideways. And you're riding on it, but it's made using the telekinetic spell. So it allows you to fly above the ground, skim over the tree line. I think it lets you go like 500 feet or 1,000 feet above in the air is as high as you can go on it. But all you need is a PowerPoint to run it. You put a PowerPoint into the board, step on it, and there you go. Um, speaking of which, so, so here's the thing. Let's say that you had one of these um, hoverboards and, and it flies over top of somebody laying on the ground. Now, would it do crushing damage? I think it's no, impression. Well, I the only reason I would say I wouldn't is because it's magic. If yeah. it was like, you know, if it had a jet engine on the bottom or an anti-gravatic machine or anti-gravity machine or or something to that effect, okay, yeah, because it has to push off the ground to get there. Um, but because it's a magic wing board, I would say no. Because magic is magic. Let's say that you were in a hovercraft or it, um, I guess not a hovercraft, but like say, let's say it had like a jet engine on it, like you said, and it's using propulsion engines to hold itself up and hover in the air. Sure. And sure. then it went over somebody. Would you roast them like like fire oh, style? Yeah. Oh yeah, for sure. It'd be just like ramming them with the vehicle. Uh, I would I would go looking at the ramming damage and start looking up the rules on what happens when you know um, grape hits the middle of the road. Squish. Okay, so vehicle qualities, all terrain. The driver suffers, suffers no penalty for difficult terrain. All-terrain vehicle. I guess any kind of a hover vehicle would be all-terrain, wouldn't it? Because it's really not touching the ground. Yeah, some of the larger vehicles, you know, like a, a super lifted truck or one of the Mountaineer ATV is, is considered an all-terrain vehicle. Um, there's a couple of them in there that are literally made to be going over rocks through streams in between forests, dry beds, deserts, canyons, just going up and down and crawling around like rock, you know, like the Jeep rock crawlers would be they are able to get around a lot better than uh, most other vehicles would be. The environmental systems? you got to have air conditioning. Come on now. Right? I know, especially post-apocalyptic with all the dust and radioactivity and whatnot. You yeah, and that's what a lot of, of people, I think, don't, uh, don't look at whenever they play riffs. They don't look at how the environment can impact the characters in one way, shape, or form. I mean, you can have um, – I, I had one game where we opened up that we were near a ley line and a rift opened up and solar flares were coming through the rift and they're like, okay, well we get out of the way. We're going to stay far away from the rift and we're going to drive away. But they didn't realize there was heat and there was radiation that they didn't, that they didn't prepare for or weren't prepared for. And they were completely exposed. And, you know, so next thing you know, they're losing points. They're getting weaker and weaker. 
Um, they're barely crawling into a town and they're literally like day glow green because they're so radiated. Um, everybody's sensors in the town are going off going, oh my God, what's wrong with these people? Um, you can really do a lot of havoc on guys if you just do simple things like reduce the amount of oxygen um, in a certain area, create radiation, which you can't see, um, increase the heat, you know, the, the pressure in that particular space. Maybe they crawl into a, a crater of an explosion for cover, and then they realize that the crater has um, greater gravity than the rest of the world around them. It, the environment is a really good tool for GMs to be able to use. So having stuff like environmental systems in a, in a uh, vehicle is kind of important, especially for robot vehicles or any kind of large um, armored personnel carriers in that effect. Not only is it cooler, but you have radiation, you know, you have light, because sometimes you go into total darkness or places where you can't use light. And some of the basics is you need just to survive. Oxygen. Yeah. That's always a given. That's always a fun one to take away. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm just imagining I'm on my hover cycle. It has like thruster engines and stuff that like rotate so I can do vertical takeoff and landing. And I'm right. cruising along and I see some critter or some dude, you know, maybe Benny owes me a couple hundred bucks from poker last night. And he's, you, you know, he's not going to pay up. And he's maybe he's on the outskirts of town and I'm cruising by because I just went to like the 912 instead of the 711 picked up myself like a, a futuristic slurpee or something like that and then as i see him i just sort of shoot up to him and and let you know let loose with the blasters and, and torch him a little bit just a little barbecue fun ah, i just want to roll those dice <laughs> uh air and hovercraft so these vehicles require piloting to operate ng right. i'm starting to know what this is this is the northern gun 150 street runner hover cycle now, is this like uh, Luke Skywalker sand crawler looking thing, or what? It, what would this thing look like? The Street Runner hover cycle looks more like a um, a crotch rocket, like a ninja. Okay. So it, instead of wheels, it has jet propulsion nozzles that'll you know they can rotate and move to keep you above the ground. The nice thing about it, it's very small, it's very compact, and it's very very fast. Do they? Is is there like? Um... Segways in rifts? Can you get like a turbo If you charts? really want one, you can have <laughs> Man, there's so many things that I want to have. Um, what's the difference between a street runner hover cycle and a hover cycle? Well, the street runner is just that. It's a speedster. It's a, you know, it's a, it's a high motion, 150 mile an hour, you know, running around with your hair on fire kind of thing. Well, the hover cycle is more a traditional, you know, heavy bike. It's a bigger bike. It moves a little slower, has lots of power. Um, but definitely can take a lot better beating than the uh, street runner can. Okay, I got you. So the Magnum Tur the Magnum Turbo hover cycle has is just like a faster one kind of a thing. Oh yeah, that one can go. It says it can go electric engine, five hundred mile range before you'll have to either yeah before it needs one night of a recharge, so eight hour recharge, which is pretty good. But it's it can handle that up to four hundred feet, dude. That's that's ridiculous. So yeah, the, the top speed on some of these things, like uh, the hover cycle has a top speed of 60. So you got to yeah. divide that by five, which gives you 12. If you were to top speed this thing into a wall, you're rolling 12 D6. <laughs> yeah, buddy. That sounds like a lot of fun. That is some crushing damage. How do you handle these things dropping? It says some of them can drop up to 100 feet. So anything up to 100 feet, he could just basically like sail off a cliff and just, you know, sponge sort of land on the ground as he cruises off. It depends on how high up. Um, you know, if he's, if he's 100 feet or less, the engines can fight gravity on the way down to keep you from, you know, falling to your death. But if you fall off a cliff and you drop a you know half a mile or whatever that distance is into a crevasse, uh, yeah, there's not enough uh, boost in that engine to help you. All it's going to do is drag you down with it. This here says don't go too high. Has has have they ever figured out what's up there, or is this just a rifts thing, not a or sorry a savage rifts thing, not a rifts thing? No, actually. So in rifts, there is actually a set of satellites that are floating around the Earth. And those satellites are like killer sats. They destroy anything that comes within a certain range of orbit, out either leaving or entering. Um, apparently, the computer system that was running them, Skynet, you know, we can quote unquote call it that. The computer system that was running it went haywire when all of the rifts happened and it lost communication and everything. So it kept its main directive, defend the Earth against everything and itself on top of that. There's even some 
uh, well, I don't know if they, you know, it depends on how you play your game, but there are some glitter boys that were made for space and they're up there um, and they should probably still be piloted. I know some have come down to the planet and, you know, that some players and some GMs have allowed them to play as player characters, but yeah, there's stuff up there that'll keep you from going too high up into space. You will get shot out of the sky if you go too high. So is that just generally something that you would have happen? You know, like you know, if this guy's like, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into the, into the, uh, you know, into space or whatever. You're like, okay, yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah, like, just- I'm gonna go to the outer atmosphere. Yeah, just as you see a, you know, a large laser beam or railgun firing from a satellite as it shoots you down and you go smoking down back into the ground. Oh yeah, I've done that lots of times. But what a lot of people don't realize is the, um, there's a bunch of nexuses and there's a bunch of rifts um, and ley lines that allow you to transport. No, anywhere you want to go in the universe, in the multiverse, um, dimensions and other planets and other parts of the of the galaxy. So just because there's a, a sat linked uh, network of killer satellites floating around the Earth doesn't mean that you can't get around them. So I want, I'm wondering what would be the point of writing that into the story. And that's what I was thinking. Like, if you could literally, like, sort of take a rift to go to other planets or different dimensions and, and Rift's Earth is full of all of these different DBs and stuff like that, what's the point in having satellites up there, is it just like a fluff thing? Like, why why would you want to restrict your players from doing something like that? It, it probably is. It's probably something that they wrote in as fluff and then realized after the fact that, hey, you know, we why do we have to have all this stuff up there? I'm sure if you go into um, one of the source books, talks about that a little more. But if you go into one of those or one of the dimension books, it'll tell you <laughs> a little bit more information of why they chose what they chose. Yeah. You know, you know, Kevin's like, yeah, stupid Ralph always wanted to go to space. I showed him. <laughs> right. That'll teach him from going up into orbit. Yeah, I'll show you, you dummy Ralph. I hate playing with you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think the actual Rifts book is called uh, Mutants in Orbit. There's a, it's an adventure and source book for Rifts and another Palladium um, world game called After the Bomb. And I believe it talks about a lot of the, uh, not only the fun equipment and you know all the different professions and creature origins and other stuff like that, but all the different things you can do, what awaits you, and or- what happens in orbit. Yeah, uh, here, just looking at this uh, article, or the page about it, it says, um, uh, let me see, where does it go? Of course, anything is possible in the future rifts after the bomb setting. And it goes to creating a character. But I know it talks about the killer satellites and all the different reasons of why you can't go into space and adapting to space. Lots of fun stuff in there, but if you haven't looked it up, look up Mutants in Orbit. I'm sure it'll give you way more answers than you want um, just for that particular to, for that particular game. Techno Wizard, Skyboat. What are you doing with the Skyboat? Anything you want to. You have a Skyboat. Can you put lasers <laughs> and cannons and guns? And how big is a? Is it like a, oh, it's like a small yacht sized craft? Capable yeah, like I of... said, you can go just about anywhere. It's a Skyboat. It'll fly around <sighs> all over the place. A lot of fun. Nice. This just now I could do 50 Fathoms Rift style in my sky boat. I, I was going to mention to you, have you never played 50 Fathoms Rift style? No. <laughs> I played 50 about, Fathoms. Think about that for a minute. <laughs> think about that for a minute. Instead of uh, black powder guns and cannons, you have rail guns and, sh- and big bore shotguns. Oh, uh, that big bore shotgun might make its way into my 50 Fathoms campaign. <laughs> I'm just saying no, that thing's around, sweet. Your 50 Fathoms campaign will make it into a big Boar Savage Rifts game. That's what you should oh, do. Jeez. So <laughs> skyboats, are they used for anything? Like are they like a bounty hunters thing? Are, are this the kind of thing you get when you're rich? Are they just used for um, you know, it depends. It you, you just gotta get creative with um a lot of the vehicles, which is nice, right? Because you can do everything from like uh, you know, a Mad Max game where you find the shell of a sky boat, put wheels on it use your techno wizard to put energy into it. And now you're driving across the, you know, across North America in a sky boat with wheels. You can use it as a real yacht. That's actually on the water that you use to transport yourself and goods uh, back and forth from Atlantis to, you know, the Bermuda triangle or wherever else you want to do. It all depends on the games. You can get really, really creative on what the, um, the boats or the vehicles look like. It's just like trappings for powers. Um, you know, use that and make that a part of your game. Just use the same statistics for every single one. At the end of the day, it's not really going to matter other than the wheeled one will travel on the ground and the sky boat, excuse me, has vertical takeoff and landing. So somebody's got the pickups. That's <laughs> what I get for drinking on the job. Oh, me too. I don't drink, but still, sometimes I do. But shh. 
So I think that's kind of cool that they put in vehicle qualities with the all-terrain and stuff like that because the, the, the vehicle qualities when I'm looking at it and you know sort of giving it a little bit of a once-over seems to me that the, you could literally take like say like a cargo container and maybe strap a sure. couple of engines onto like a sure. giant metal box sure. and then you sure. could just say okay you know what you want to take uh, some environmental systems in your little black box and maybe some vertical takeoff or something like that and then as you progress sure. you, you slowly like turn this big box or, or you know like a, your yeah. container that's actually kind of neat turn it into something yeah the, that's the, one of the things that's the, that the techno wizard has the advantage of is a techno wizard can pretty much create anything using all the magic spells that they have at their disposal and maybe even a few others they don't have to take a vehicle that's actually put together you know if you want to throw some kind of frankenstein's monster together three different vehicles and a hearst <laughs> put some four by four wheels on it and then have it vertical take off and land because of the techno wizard um you can do that kind of crazy stuff in rifts particularly with a techno wizard but there's no reason why an operator can't do the same thing and turn a amphibious vehicle into a flying vehicle or vice versa given enough, enough money and time and inclination most player characters will, will get pretty creative and come up with different ways to transport themselves across the planet i think that's actually kind of slick because it doesn't seem like there's a lot of vehicles i mean there there's enough to get you started but i really like that they left that piece sort of open to your imagination you know start picking up some scraps maybe you know um, in yeah. some of your adventures you find uh you know like a broken motor that you can take or whatever and fix it and yeah, then, exactly you know, it gives you just enough to be able to play with it did the same thing that they did with power armor and with robots you have yeah. enough to cover a lot of your bases, a lot of the basic vehicles that a lot of people are used to, you know, the Big Boss ATV, the Highwayman, the Mountaineer, the Zone Ranger, all of those are classic um, armored all-terrain vehicles that can carry a bunch of the um, characters or the cast of your game. And they were really smart about putting all that into one page or a couple of pages for vehicles just to give you the basics so you can kind of figure out how to uh, translate all the other ones because there's a slew. Just like there's a whole bunch of armor and a whole bunch of weapons and robot vehicles and power armor, there is a slew of vehicles from you know high speed Mach two jets, uh, combat fighters. There's even um, tanks, flying tanks, hover tanks, spider tanks, armored personnel carriers, bombers. <laughs> you name it, every vehicle you can think of, and some you had never even thought of are in this game. Um, TK Flyer. So this is another. Um techno wizard deal but it seems like a tk flyer is basically like a small plane like a jet plane or something like that yeah Cares so like a like people? a multi-prop plane like a, a cessna two engine jet or two engine turboprop um that's the same thing as what a tech, tk flyer was the only difference is the engines run off of ppe not off of gasoline or nuclear or fission powered or battery powered so you can literally put you know put it over a ley line and it'll go forever Nice. Um, and then this wing board. So the wing board holds just one person. Now, is this uh, is a wing board a like a glider that we would see like one person in float jumping off the mountain and you know floating down, or is it more yeah. like a sit like a surfboard? I've seen it done a bunch of different ways. I've seen people use old predator drones as wing boards. I've seen people use surfboards a couple of skateboards, skis, a wing off an airplane. Um, you can get creative with the wing board. You can actually put like little wings on your boots and, you know, you click your heels together like Dorothy and you can create a wing board. That's one of the nice thing about vehicles. Like I said before, take some trappings, turn it into something unique to your character and then just give it the stats of a wing board and you can run with it. But traditionally, yeah, it's um, a little bit, it's like a small uh, wave board, a wake board. It's about that big and it's turned sideways and you just stand on it and your feet magnetize to it and boom, off you go. Very cool. I would like to get a techno wizard. Uh, I don't know if I was if we were talking about this in Deadlands when you're playing uh, the Flood, the second adventure, third adventure. Yeah. Uh, did I tell you about the little device that pops off? It's like a drone. And if you fall off the train... <laughs> the drone comes out of the top and it runs over and it's got one of those like prize hooks. You know, you put a, a dollar and you try and get the teddy. It's got one of those. So it comes down and latches onto you and then just picks you up and then flies you back, puts to the you train. back on the train. <laughs> I'd like to that's get that. Yeah, that's pretty it. smart. It's, that's my techno wizard flying device. Cause at least then when I'm on it, I still, I don't have to do nothing. I, I just like sort of hang in a little, maybe a swing or a basket or something underneath it. And I go fly it off. I can gun people down. 
Sure, sure. I've seen people put together different stuff like um, they've used um, stats for like a TK flyer, you know, the dual engine propped um, telekinetic plane, but they've done the opposite where they've taken like a hot air balloon that runs off of ley line energy and they've got like, a, you know, a Gatling gun mounted on the basket of the side of the of the uh, hot air balloon and they're shooting <laughs> targets on the ground as they go. I mean, it doesn't have a lot of speed. He can't do, you know, loop to loops or dodge a lot of stuff, but God forbid you're on the ground. Uh, taking fire from this thing you'll want to shoot it down quickly man somebody needs to stat out yeah. savage riffs mary poppins rolls in on her <laughs> umbrella you know what i mean she's got like a badass gatling gun strapped to her or totally. something like that she flies that in would... on your umbrella maybe she's got the big bore shotgun that you're the room sweeper <laughs> oh mary that, poppins and she's pissed that, that sounds like a fun game you got to write that one up that sounds the, like a, a fun riffs game the kids have been bad and Poppins is back. <laughs> Ground vehicles. We don't have many of these either. But again, like, you know, they sort of left it up to your to your imagination. You've got an ATV that you can take out. Um, everybody knows what an ATV, all-terrain vehicle is. So like a little four-wheel drive kind of a buggy that you can shoot around with. Yep. There's um, a motorcycle. That's pretty standard. What else we got here? The Mountaineer all-terrain vehicle that's kind of like a, if you took a Winnebago and put three big oversized tractor um, tires on it, that's what it would look like. But it's pretty durable. The one nice thing about the Mountaineer ATV is um, it's really big. It can go a really long range. Uh, it really tough. has a lot of mods that you can put to it. Uh, it's a pretty big, beefy vehicle. I think it only goes like 100 miles an hour or so. Um, but uh, let's see. Hold on. Here's the toughness, toughness of 25 and 14. So pretty tough little vehicle they can take a beating nice why do i not see i mean i see that it says remaining mods five but why did why is there not like a mod section in the vehicle deal here there is if you go a little bit further you'll see a lot of stuff um, when it comes to adventuring gear cybernetics um different upgrades and whatnot so in, that you can do yeah and you can take some section. of those and put them in there yeah so it's in the it's in the gear section then yeah it'll it'll come up a little later yeah, Some of the stuff to... I think you can take from <laughs> the uh, tables also. Yeah, every once in a while, Savage Worlds does something like that where they, they won't group things together, in, you know, like in the sections that you think that they would go in. But that's cool. So the Mountaineer ATV is like a big-ass uh, Winnebago that you can take. It's got a bunch of slots that you can slot things into. I'm, I'm assuming you, you could get things like extra shielding or maybe laser guns or slot in like uh, missiles or something like that. Um, sure. Yeah. Anti-personnel weapons, uh, grenade launchers, smoke launchers, uh, amphibious. Uh, you know, it depends. A modify a mod is a mod. You can make it do what you want to do. If you want to go take get ahead of the book there and go to page one twenty three. At the bottom of the page is a picture of a Mountaineer Mark II ATV. Well, let's go a have a of, look uh, and see. A couple of machine guns. It's a six wheeled vehicle. It's a pretty large, oversized, you know, armored truck, armored personnel carrier. Oh yeah. You can just imagine the stuff that you can be putting into it. Have you um, um, watched Fear the Walking Dead? Not The yeah. Walking Dead, but yeah. Fear the Walking yeah. Dead. Yeah. The, the lady's got the, I can't remember what her name is, but she's the filmographer. And she's always trying to get everybody's story and stuff like that. She's, that's a pretty badass friggin' post-apocalyptic yeah. wagon. Yeah, you could easily reskin the Big Boss ATV or even the, the um, that big old beast right there, the... Um, What's it called? The Mountaineer Mark II. You can just skin that and use the use the trappings from her vehicle and say, "This is what I'm driving." That would be boss. Zone Ranger ATV, another Techno Wizard alternative. Oh, so this is their alternative to the Mountain Mountaineer. Basically, it's a it's a crew, um, seven person, eight person, four mods, a little bit the smaller deal that runs off of PP. Yeah, instead. but look at that toughness. It's a 32 toughness. Oh Jesus. <laughs> well, that's a shot from a rail gun. And then, and it don't... could w would you let your your techno wizard cast armor <laughs> on his on his oh, machine? Yeah. Oh yeah? hell yeah! Oh hell yeah! If he's got the if he's spent the money and he's got the power points and the right abilities to be able to flick a switch to turn the shields on, so to speak. Oh yeah, I'd have him add add shields to that vehicle without a doubt. A lot of the guys I know who play uh, Techno Wizards already have their standard set of equipment that they require on all their vehicles and armor because they're prepared for everything. 
Yeah, that's really cool. And then I guess uh, essentially that's it. So then you know you just throw your weapons yeah. and tools and mods on your on your deals and in a way you go. Aquatic mode upgrade. Is this where this stuff is? Uh, see, because it's it all goes into cybernetics. All right. Well, cybernetics next time. I guess. <laughs> Let's find out what we can attach to ourselves. Sweet. That was nice and easy. Looks like we uh, bucked an hour, and uh, we'll put a pin in that one and call her here. Oh, uh, whoa, uh, bloody hell. Oh, man, I love this guy. Do we have to go yet? Yes. Oh, please. Of, of course we do. We've got work to do. Please let me stay just a little bit longer. Stop it, Jeffrey. Oh, right, come on back through the rift there. Fine. Daddy here. Well, the sweet sound of that rift opening means it's time to pack up Portal Out. Take us out with some contact info, Victor. You can reach us at the Murder Hobo Show at gmail.com or get us on Twitter if you can keep it under 140 characters at Murder Hobo Show. Or, of course, over on the Google Plus page, Murder Hobo Show, under the Nerds International banner. You can also reach out to myself directly at the Google Plus Savage Rifts page, where the community's always for the fans, by the fans, jumping up and down. I think we have one post every day, if not more often. I was looking at some of the um, numbers for nerds and the stats for nerds, and I think we have 34 postings a month. And we have almost 647 people uh, joining in the craziness. So thank you all for hanging out with us. We appreciate it. It's always a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. It's sometimes it's fun. Sometimes it's <laughs> not. Sometimes you're jerks and we don't want to hang out with you or hear from you. So uh, contact us or not. We don't care. Right, Victor? We'll Spe just speaking you. of, what happened to jerk number one and jerk number two? I haven't heard from them lately. Uh, I'm sure they'll be around now. <laughs> We've been on hiatus, so they haven't been able to jerk us out. <laughs> uh, that said, be sure to swing by the Murder Hobo Show on Podbean. Check out the show notes for some cool links to creative people, places, and things. Yeah, uh, don't forget to catch us on other podcasts, Threat Streets and Timers, where we talk about the one and only index card role-playing game. Oh, yeah. Damn straight. Uh, tune in next time. We'll have another action pack show, and we are going to be tackling more in the uh, character section. Cybernetics. So is is that just like the things that you can like strap on yourself if you wanted to have like uh, you know better vision, so you get like an electric eyeball or something like that? Strap on. That's all I'm going to say. Ah, and on that note, <laughs> peace out, suckers. See ya. The Murder Hobo Show is not affiliated with or endorsed by any companies mentioned on this show. Any of the products mentioned on our show or appear on our website are the property and copyright of their respected owners. All items are used under fair use and education or review purposes. All other items are the intellectual property of the Murder Hobo Show, copyright 2018, all rights reserved.